Welcome to the viewers of this segment of uh, EGIL Live. And I have with me Professor Liam Murphy, who, whose article, Law Beyond the State, Some Philosophical Questions, we are publishing in the most recent issue of EGIL, in a debate where there are reaction pieces by Neil Buter, Christoph Mollers, Samantha Besson, and Jochen von Bernstorff, with a rejoinder by uh, Liam Murphy. So you will already understand that we have given huge importance to this contribution and it's uh, different in some ways because Liam Murphy is a legal philosopher and with the exception of one earlier piece on state responsibility this is a, his first major foray into international law as part of a book you're publishing. Yes, so I, I recently wrote a book which is kind of an advanced introduction to classic issues in legal philosophy and I felt, even though venturing into international law was a challenge for me, I felt that it would be irresponsible <laughs> to once again leave international law out. I mean, as you're probably aware, apart from chapter 10 of Hart's concept of law, at least Anglo-American legal philosophers have largely neglected international law in the, in the past 40, 50 years. And partly uh, as a response to the long-term urging of Benedict Kingsbury, our colleague, who for years has been saying this is unacceptable, I decided to have, give it a go. And a, a very worthwhile go. Uh, and indeed, I think uh, just about everybody interested in EGIL and international law will profit from this article. Now, you, there are two issues that I think you principally deal with is one is something you call grounds of law and that's something you will I'm going to invite you to explain okay. what do you mean by grounds of law and why should we worry about it mm -hmm. and the other is a classical issue how right. do we determine when there is international law that every international lawyer will react well of course we know how to determine yeah. when there is international law but uh, if we listen up there is indeed a lot to learn from this piece yeah. so let's start with grounds of law Okay, so grounds of law, that's terminology that comes from Ronald Walken, and it's really the question, what factors are relevant when you're trying to answer the question, what is the content of the law that's in force around here? And so this is the topic about which positivists and non-positivists disagree. The positivists saying only matters of fact are relevant to determining the content of the law in force, or only matters of fact are among the grounds of law and a non-positivist such as Dworkin saying it's both matters of fact and moral considerations are relevant to determining the content of the law in force. So Is that you, a kind of closet natural law? It's not really natural law. I mean, that's one of the things I try to address in the article. Natural law is a theory of morality uh, and um, it's a theory of the sources of morality and the way to understand our moral obligations. We loosely, although I'm pleased to say not so much anymore, have talked about natural law theories of law, natural law theories of the positive law, but that would suggest or imply that only moral norms are legal norms. And if there's any uh, deviation between morality and the positive law, the positive law isn't really law at all. So that's not the view that Dworkin defended. And that I don't think anybody, certainly Thomas Aquinas didn't defend that view either. I don't think anybody has ever defended that view. The, the contending view is that in addition to the matters of fact that are relevant for establishing law, there are moral considerations that should guide our interpretation. And I, as I say, I think Dworkin's version of it is the, the best way to understand the non-positivist interpretation, uh, non-positivist uh, alternative, because he's basically saying it's all very well to have the statute and say, these are the facts, there's the statute, but you've got to interpret the statute. And he's saying good interpretation will make the best moral sense of the statute. And the positivist will say, no, a straight reading is all you can do when you're trying to figure out what the law is. When you go beyond that and make the best moral case, you're making law, exercising discretion, you're going beyond the law. Let's just stick with this before we go back to grounds of law. Mm -hmm. Would that be the sort of introducing moral principles in the sense that you have just outlined via Dworkin? Might that be more complicated in the international legal context in the sense that 
when you're talking about state law, there is some kind of common understanding yes. of a community of moral principles. When you go international law, it's a much more diverse cultural and perhaps even moral community. How, how does that work out? I think that's, a, that's very much the case. Um, I just want to say this is really what I mean by the grounds of law because the positive is just going to say you're not going to include among the grounds of law these moral considerations that would affect your interpretation. And the non-positivist will say you are going to include these moral considerations uh, as they guide your interpretation. They are part of the grounds of law. But you're absolutely right that when it comes to international law, to say that the content of the law is fixed by the morally best interpretation of the legal materials starts to raise you know, eyebrows because a moral, in, moral reading, to use Dworkin's uh, words, is always going to be someone's moral reading. And it's natural to worry that it's going to be the moral reading of the dominant uh, powers in the world. And you know, that's, 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 I think, a, a reason why many people are more resistant to non-positivism in the international context than in the, in the domestic context. And still on this almost sideline, do you take a position on that? On the I don't take a position. I mean, I've struggled with, I've taught this material for 20 years more. I've struggled with it because I think I don't belong to the fairly large group of people who think that the whole debate is a waste of time, it's just playing with words. This is just a verbal debate where the boundary of law ends is not important, many people say. I don't think that's true. I think uh, the concept of law matters It's because we need to figure out what the content of law is. And we need to figure out what the content of law is because that matters to us. We have moral reasons frequently to obey the law and so it's important that we can have a view about how to figure out the content of law. So I think it's an important question. However, I don't see any way of making progress. This is a, my, my position is, somewhat paradox, paradoxical because I say the question is important but I don't see any prospect for progress in resolving the disagreement. I think the disagreement reflects two fundamentally opposed pictures of what kind of thing law is. The one picture is law is with social reality and not the brooding omnipresence in the sky, to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes. And the other picture is, no, law is tied up with right and, and justice, and so it must be partly uh, a matter of, uh, of right and wrong and not just a matter of brute facts. And I think these two fundamental pictures are just out there in the world, and we have to live with that. How do we go forward, given that we do need to be able to figure out what the content of law is? My, um, take on that is that as it happens, though the debate is theoretically important and interesting, the two views overlap in the vast majority of cases on their implications for what the content of the law is. And that's how we're able to get along um, despite this disagreement. I can see why international law for a long time and still today sort of is very attractive to positivism. Yeah. It's not only, even in the, in the Eurocentric accepted mm -hmm. view of the earlier or the, until the mid part of the 20th century, because its credentials of, as law yes. were so tenuous, so positivism yes. seemed to anchor it yes. into uh, a more respectable and uh, a more right. credible claim to normativity. Right. And then when you have acceptance of a more multicultural international society. So again, the, if one can say the escape to positivism is to try and, or at least the pretense of positivism is, well, this is the same for everybody regardless yes. of their morally yes. bounded uh, understanding right. of life and society. Right, we can argue with people from a different cultural background with different moral outlook about what the content of law equally binding on all of us is without resolving our moral disagreements. That's the promise of positivism. So maybe just uh, in a teaspoon, uh, heart is at the background. Mm -hmm. and I suppose I'm like most people in the Anglo-American tradition, very familiar with chapter 10. Yeah. So how do you move beyond that? What's your probably respectful critique or lacunas right. in heart? <laughs> 
So I was motivated to talk about Hart's chapter 10 in part because um, I greatly admire Hart. Um, I think that he gave positivism, although he was drew a lot from Hans Kelsen, he gave positivism its most plausible sort of, um, how should we, how should we put it? He presented it in a form that we could live with and, and it didn't involve any crazy metaphysical stuff as Kelsen's view seemed to, to many people. Um, but he wrote this chapter 10 and I think it's the weakest chapter of the book. And, but I, and it's been widely regarded as a, not a very strong contribution. But I thought it was important to get straight just where it goes awry, um, out of respect for Hart, perhaps, because uh, I think he was frequently misunderstood by some of his uh, critics. So, for example, one of his main aims in the chapter was to say that international law was just as much law as domestic law, even though it was different in very important ways from domestic law. And here, I think his main motivation was to reply to Kelsen who he thought assumed that if it's, if it's law, it had to be law in exactly the same way as, as domestic law. So that's the whole thing about there being no uh, rule of recognition in international law. He thought there was no rule of recognition in international law, but he's partly saying that to say, there doesn't need to be one, it's still law, even if it doesn't have a rule of recognition. So I wanted to talk about that. Which, which, which seems, it comes as a bit of a shock to the reader. Because when you get to that chapter, you're so convinced that without a rule of recognition, don't have we don't have a concept yes. of law, yes. and suddenly you're surprised to see him yes. backtrack. Yes, so what, what, I, what I think, if there's a contribution in this just discussion of heart, what I wanted to bring out there was that what he really meant by saying there's no rule of recognition uh, was that it's a, it's a one-step legal order. There's no hierarchy in it. So he could also have said, it's all rule of recognition, right? So here's what I mean by that. The rule of recognition is, contains the ultimate criteria of legal validity. And what's distinctive about the rule of recognition is that it's not in force because of some higher rule. It's that, you know this already, but it's the highest rule in the system. And for most uh, rules within domestic systems, we're gonna say, you know, this statute is valid uh, in virtue of it being enacted in accordance with the Constitution. Why is the Constitution in force? Well, that's because of the rule of recognition. Why is the rule of recognition in force? It just is. It's in force because people accept it. So what Hart is really saying about international law is that it's all international legal validity is all validity of the highest level just because it's accepted. There's no systemic validity. There's no going down the system. So all the norms of international law, and he thought international law was purely norms of customary law, they're valid in virtue of being accepted. So that's, that's it, his position. So a uh, kind of a footnote that I think uh, many listeners, and also in order to whet people's mm -hmm. appetite to dig into your yeah. article. So would use Kogan's not be at least a negative sort of, uh, in terms of a hierarchy that it's a way of saying this rule of law is not valid because it contradicts uh, norm of use Kogan's? Yes, so I think Which that... Which Hart does not deal with. It's he doesn't, number, firstly he doesn't deal with, and secondly I don't think he's right that, the rule, that there's no systemic validity in international law because I think he confuses, and I'm not the first person who pointed this out, I think he confuses the kind of acceptance that he has in mind when he talks about what uh, ca accounts for a rule of recognition being in force and the kind of acceptance that's necessary for customary law to be uh, valid. So in customary law, we have state practice and the opinio juris. Uh, in the case of the rule of recognition, the kind of acceptance he has in mind is legal officials generally. And so the, the uh, subjects who have to accept in the case of opinio juris are the states, not sort of uh, judges. Um, so there's a mistake there. I think he's, it's just not true that there's no systemic validity in international law, even on Hartian terms. And if you take that step, then you can plug opinio juris in as a sort of a, a filter for what can be. Uh, use Kogan's, I'm sorry, use Kogan's, yes. 
uh, in his defense, one should say that A, he was writing in the United Kingdom, which is yes. extreme dualist. <laughs> yeah. So indeed, international law, the reach to judges was tenuous, if at all. And also in at a time in the evolution of constitutionalism, where there was really, even in non-dualist countries, right. it was a tenuous reach. But right. probably, so what would you say is your main addition, critique and addition to the Hartian view? So I think he, um, so the, the, the critique is that I think even in his own terms, he should have seen the availability of systemic validity with international law. So there are ultimate criteria of validity. It's not all just first order, first order norms. Um, that may not be such a big deal because I also go on to say that it doesn't really seem to matter terribly much <laughs> whether international law is a system in that sense um, that Hart had in, was talking about or not. And I think it's very important to distinguish Hart's claim international law is not a system from an important question, the question of fragmentation of international law. So this is where I'm not so much criticizing Hart, but saying, don't mistake what he's saying when he says international law is not a system with something else you might say, which is very important, that international law is fragmented. It's not a unified normative order. They're two different problems. So I think my discussion of Hart is mostly motivated by a desire to say, look, I think he's wrong, even in his sense of system, it is a system, but even if he were right that in his sense of system, it isn't a system, it wouldn't really matter. That's not the same sense of system, legal system, that is really important, which is picked up by the so-called fragmentation issue in international legal theory. And in where do you years. stand on that? I stand on that by pleading, by pleading ignorance. I mean, it's because I think my understanding of whether international law is fragmenting, I think it's, it's a doctrinal question. It's an institutional and doctrinal question and philosophers aren't gonna be able to solve it. Normatively, I, I, I think, and this is tentative, I prefer it to be the case that international law does not fragment. So on the question of would it matter, I think yes, it does matter because I think a non-fragmented legal order can generate uh, greater normative force uh, for those parts of international law that um, are not very well supported by self-interest. There's also quite a bit of, uh, it's a bit slippery when people talk about fragmentation. It's a little bit underspecified because yes. for some, when they think of fragmentation, all they have in mind is that the coexistence of different legal regimes within international law can create conflicts, can create contradictory norms. But as long as the system has a way, some way of dealing with it, or even if there right. remains some tension, it doesn't mean that the system as such has fragmented. And I think it's a, it's a minority view that would claim that fragmentation has gone so deep that... Yes. Uh, Yes, we're familiar in domestic uh, contexts, obviously. You know, state law might be in conflict with federal law, and then there will be a high level norm to deal with the conflict. So that's not a situation of fragmentation. Fragmentation would be, as I understand it, would be a situation where one part of, of so one legal regime is in conflict with another legal regime, and there's no all things considered legal answer to what the, what the norm is. That, that's real fragmentation. The rabbis in the Talmud have a very whimsical take on mm -hmm. this. They take two con totally contradictory positions and they say, what does it matter? Both are the living word of God. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to your next one, which yeah. is uh, a little bit closer to yes. what preoccupies international lawyers in their thinking and in their practice of international law, the sort of almost so how do you put into practice the getting to know what the norm is and uh, the, 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 the second part of your piece, the second question in your piece? The, the question of what makes uh, whether international law is a legal order or some other kind of order. Yes, so that's, you know, I think, um, and also in, in the book that this is drawn from, there have been two main questions that legal philosophers are interested in. There's the grounds of law and then there's the question of, is this normative order an order of law? So as opposed to what famously 
uh, you know, Austin in the 19th century said, international law is not an order of law, it's positive morality, it's conventional morality. And he thought it was not an order of law because in order to be an order of law, it needed a commander. You needed someone to issue orders. We don't believe that anymore. No, you know, nobody defends the idea that uh, without a, a sovereign to do the commanding, you don't have an order of law. But, but this is a conceptual question. I mean, it's how we categorize uh, different kinds of normative orders and whether international the international order should be grouped with the domestic orders as order of orders of law. And I was surprised to find myself taking a stand on this question because I'm generally a little reluctant to think that philosophers can tell you what the right answer or even offer much in the way of good arguments uh, for you know, what the right understanding of a particular concept. But it did strike me that a, a sort of a skeptical position on this, namely, it didn't matter whether international law was law or not law. We know what it does. The categorization doesn't matter. That has always struck me as implausible. It does seem to me that we have something in mind when we say it's law. Uh, but the question is, what is it? <laughs> so various tests for what would make something count as an order of law as opposed to something else are obviously wrong. We don't think it needs, you know, courts of universal and compulsory jurisdiction. That's not necessary. We don't think it, it needs an international and legislature. That's not necessary. And there are various other possibilities. But the one that strikes me as most important is the connection between our idea of law and the idea of enforcement. And I do think that there's something going on there. And I was, so I, I was very interested in exploring the connection between the idea of law and the idea of enforcement, particularly because I don't think it's true that you don't have law unless you have actual infect effective enforcement in place. So if you took that view, a norm that is not enforceable in fact by actual mechanisms is not a legal norm, that would be a disaster. It would follow from that not just that uh, international law is less law-like because it has less effective enforcement. The president is not subject to law in vast areas of his powers for the same reason, because there's no enforcement as against the president. So uh, I really think it's important that we do not think that norms count as legal only if they're enforced. So I explore this problem. It doesn't seem to be true that you need actual enforcement for a norm to be a legal norm, but the idea that there's no connection between enforcement and, and our sense of what law is seems equally implausible. So I come up with this hypothesis that when we call something a legal norm, uh, we're, we're saying that it's in the nature of the case that enforcement would in principle be justified if it were feasible. Um, so it's the kind of thing that is uh, in principle enforceable just in virtue of being law. And the contrast here would be Moral norms. We think there's a moral question. If you're breaking some moral duty, I think I've got a question. Is this, is this my business or anyone's business other than, other than yours? Maybe it is if someone else's interests are at stake, but maybe it isn't. It doesn't follow from the very idea that there's a moral norm, that third parties have any interest in it, that it's the business of third parties. But I do think from the idea of a legal norm, we think that uh, in principle, what we're saying is that this is the kind of thing that is worthy of in enforcement or could be in justifiably enforced. So that's what I take to be my contribution on, on that issue. Um, and I think that helps us deal with, uh, you know, the difference between international law and soft law, because when we're saying this is a soft law, a gentleman's agreement, we're saying precisely that it's not the kind of thing that we think should be up for enforcement. And I apply it in the article to these discussions about global governance and uh, this admi uh, global administrative law project. I've been puzzled for a while. What, what is it to say there ought to be a law? You know, what makes it diff what's the difference between saying there ought to be a law and these agencies ought to behave differently? <laughs> so that's, that's what that investigation is about. Uh, our time is kind of drawing up, but one of the things that is uh, we do regularly, but only maybe one or two per issue, uh, 
you were involved in what we call an Egil debate. You had yes. four interlocutors, yes, uh, whom we thought were uh, appropriate and up to the challenge of uh, interlocutory okay. with the philosopher. What did you gain from that? I gained tremendously from it. It was a great honor to have four distinguished international legal scholars read my piece and respond to it. Um, did any of them make you change your mind? Uh, yes, I think a couple of points were made uh, both by Nehal Bhutta and Samantha Besson that I, I uh, realized that I had missed. Um, so, for example, in talking about enforcement of international law, I mean, it's an obvious point to anyone who works in the field, but as an outsider, I just sort of missed it um, or, you know, uh, forgot it, which is enforcement. We shouldn't think about international enforcement. We have to remember domestic enforcement is hugely important, so you can get a very distorted picture of the difference between international enforcement and domestic enforcement if you forget about that. And Neha Bhutta's challenge was very interesting um, on this question of why, we, why states should obey international law. And so the argument I uh, gave in the article was that states should obey international law for the same reason, and actually I argue that it's a stronger reason than individual subjects of domestic law have to obey law. The reasons in both cases are instrumental because of the good that's done by coordinated practice, the survival of institutions that in the state context is very obvious, you know, without, without general compliance with the law, the state doesn't get to do the various good things that we hope the state is trying to do. In the case of international law, I say the same thing is true. International law secures a, 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 a framework of international cooperation, uh, international institutions that do good. And uh, Neil Bhutta challenges me on my assumption that so much good comes from all of this um, in the international context. Uh, I had argued that the duty to obey the law for states is actually stronger than for individual subjects just because <coughs> non-compliance by a state is more obvious, could have a, a snowballing effect, there are fewer states. The impact of any one state's behavior on the sort of health of the system is much greater than for the case of individual subjects of domestic law. And Buddha replies by saying, yeah, but the good done by international law may be a lot less. So. I found that a very interesting challenge and my response really is that the good that is achieved by individual sovereign states is itself dependent on the existence of a, a well-functioning international order and that the domestic states get their ability to operate internally from the existence of a well-functioning international order. Um, so, so that's one point. But then he came, comes back, or it's, he doesn't, it was, wasn't actually a back and forth, but he, in the article is the further point, well, only some parts of the international legal order relate to sort of peaceable coexistence among states and respect for borders and so on. So maybe the reasons for states to obey international law are in fact fragmented, and which brings us back to the fragmented, the fragmentation uh, issue. And so he's inclined to say that if you really look at the instrumental case for states to, to obey the law, it may not be true that they have general reason to obey international law generally. They only have sort of, you know, focused reasons to obey international law. And he suggests that I'm, uh, in, if I'm going to make an argument that they should uh, develop dispositions to obey international law generally, they have to believe a myth that all of international law does good. So I found this very interesting, and my response is that, that we don't have to believe a myth. What we have to believe is that um, we're better off if international law as a whole is shown to be respected, if we have general compliance with international law as a whole. And the reason for this is that that will give support to those parts of international law which don't get immediate support from state self-interest. So if we think about, it's a sad subject to think about in the current climate, but if we think about 
international treaties relating to climate change. I think um, these, it seems to me, obviously can do a lot of good. And if you look at uh, the states don't necessarily have self-interested reasons to obey these things. They might hope to free, free ride. Everyone else obeys, but not us, right? So we want to support the sense of, a, of an obligation to obey uh, climate treaties. And the way to do that, I think, is to see international law as a unified normative system. So the parts of it that benefit states aren't clearly, in terms of self-interest, aren't clearly separable from the parts that are for the general good, but not necessarily for the individual good. So this, as I say, gets back to fragmentation. I think if we can see the international legal order as a unified order, um, it's clear, it seems to me, that though for any particular thing, a state might say, well, that doesn't do me any good, or that doesn't do anybody any good, we're better off if we if we uh, understand that non-compliance with any part of the international legal order will weaken the international legal order generally, and that will weaken both the general good that can be done and the, sense, the extent to which my self-interest will be served. So it, it's interesting that the, the, the argument in the piece and the discussion with some of your interlocutors indeed focuses on the deserts that international law delivers and mm -hmm. if you have to have the whole in order to... Yes. But there's much less attention given to process. And whereas for decades, it, the argument was always sovereignist, even about the authority of international law, there's more attention now because of the assent of international law, not least, and you do deal, you know, like global administrative law, they do so much, and yet it's so much more difficult to legitimate it in process terms in the way we would legitimate domestic law in democracies. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it, it's a very tough proposition, and then not as an excuse for non-performance, but as a general moral concern, and that isn't, it doesn't seem no. to occupy you too much well, or preoccupy you too much. It occupies me, but I've... My excuse is it's too big and hard and important a topic, and I didn't feel like I could address it um, adequately here. This is really the issue of legitimacy of international law and whether, um, you know, what the conditions for legitimacy uh, would be. And Samantha Besson pushes me on this, and um, she, I, she may be right. This may be the most important philosophical issue about the international legal order. And my only excuse is that I didn't feel I could address it in a, you know, in the sort of a final chapter of my book on these other so uh, this, le legal uh, issues in legal philosophy. And I, and I should say I don't address domestic legitimacy in, in the rest of, of that book either. But I do want to say one thing about Besson's um, critique is that I agree with her that consent, although consent is not the basis of the sources of international law. It doesn't ground a duty of states to obey international law. It does go a long way to giving uh, a degree of accountability in the process. A degree. I guess he's skeptical look on your no, face. No, uh, the only uh, skepticism is because when one makes that argument, one tends to conflate the state with its executive, pro with its yes, executive branch. That is a huge problem. And so, and especially there are lots for of non stakeholders that yes. are not involved in yes. giving that consent yes. or yes. consenting to that consent. Yes, it doesn't plausibly apply to non-democratic states, and for most actual democratic states, it may be tenuous there also. It yeah. privileges a particular stakeholder. Yes. So this leads me to my last question. Mm -hmm. uh, will we see more of you writing on... <laughs> I mean, there's your agenda, uh, legitimacy. Well, yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, at the moment, I, I've turned to other things, um, other interests, but sort of the next big project that I'm interested in really is sort of political philosophy in the, in the big sense, and that would definitely include turning my attention to legitimacy. And, I, and one of the things I've learned from uh, this exercise, and it's a lesson I'll continue with, carry with me, is 
there's no point talking about the domestic case without talking about the international case as well. And I think for the issue of legitimacy, it's particularly uh, inappropriate to come up with a theory of the standards for domestic the legitimacy, simply taking the state system for granted. Right? This makes no sense to me at all. So I think that's partly why I don't address it here. It seems to me such a big, such a big issue. To have an account of domestic legitimacy, you have to have an account of the legitimacy of the state system itself, which requires an account of the legitimacy of the international legal order. So uh, I would yes. entirely agree with just Alice through the looking glass. Yeah. To take seriously international law, one cannot disregard domestic law. Okay, that that is a lesson I'm <laughs> that I was slower to learn. <laughs> I, I want to thank, on behalf of all the uh, EGIL readers and watchers of EGIL Live, uh, Liam Murphy. Thank you very much, and encourage everyone to engage with this debate in the recent issue of uh, the European Journal of International Law. Thank you, Liam. Thank you all. Thank you, Joseph, very much.